<laughs> okay, so today I'm going to uh, today I'm going to tell you about our um, efforts to make JavaScript safe and secure. JavaScript safe and secure seems to many people like a ridiculous notion. It's like the last language anybody might think that to make into one for safe and secure programming. So for those who think that, I offer the following counterexample. <laughs> so over here we have a very simple piece of JavaScript. It's only using uh, an object literal as, a, as a, essentially a record of named fields and it's using uh, functions uh, and it's using lexical scoping and, the out and what we have on the outside is a function called make counter that every time it's called it makes a count variable and makes an inker function and a decker function uh, that it exposes as the corresponding named properties on the object. So every time it's called, it makes that triple, and each one of these are disconnected from each of the others. And the inker and decker function are exposed, uh, whereas uh, the count variable is encapsulated. Only the inker and decker function can get out the count variable. And an abstraction like this, uh, you can use it, for example, uh, if you have two agents guarding an entry and an exit. Let's say you're counting the people who come into or out of a room or, or, or entry or exit to whatever kind of container, you might give to an entry guard uh, the inker method and give to the exit guard the decker method. And by doing this, you've given to the entry guard only the ability to count up, and you've given to the exit guard only the ability to count down. Uh, so uh, that's the only way in which they can interact with the counter. They can only interact with each other through this counter, not any other counter instance that was made by calling make counter. Um, and if they have no other way, if they did not yet have any other way to interact with each other, then this is the only way in which they can interact with each other. So what we're seeing here is that at the foundations of object-oriented programming in any memory-safe language with encapsulation going all the way back to ECMAScript 3, um, uh, in any such language there's already a primitive permission system in the language. If you have uh, three objects, Alice, Bob, and Carol, and the object Bob does not have a reference to the object Carol, then Bob cannot invoke Carol. Bob cannot send Carol a message. Um, however, if Alice has a reference to both Bob and Carol, and Alice invokes the foo method on Carol, we refer to that as sending the foo message to Carol, uh, then Alice is both using the reference that she has as a permission to invoke Bob and granting to Bob permission to invoke Carol. So this is basically just a relabeling in security terms of the thing that all object programmers know in their bones. Uh, that we all know that we're manipulating these abilities of objects to, to, to invoke other objects. To turn this into a genuine security paradigm, we have to do very little in addition to what we're already familiar with. We have to ensure that only references carry causality um, so that there's no other means of causing effects other than using the references that you hold. And JavaScript historically has actually obeyed uh, that constraint as well. Um, and with that constraint and the, and the other constraints that I'll be getting to, the reference graph from the programming language literature becomes identical to the access graph from the access control literature. So all of the machinery that we have for manipulating the reference graph and, think, and, and using the expressivity of objects to do that gets uh, reused for writing security abstractions. This gives us a very natural way to express the principle of least authority. Um, uh, which is the principle that should be at the start of any effort to secure a system, the principle that each agent, each entity in the system should only be given the authority it needs to do its proper duties and not given too much excess authority beyond that. Uh, and the, the less excess authority it's given, the less potential there is for abuse. If it's, if it's either malicious or if it has an exploitable bug, that somebody else can then exploit. 
Uh, and we see this with the entry guard and the exit guard. Uh, the, the entry guard didn't need the ability to count down, so just don't give it the ability to count down. So the system that we've created um, uh, uh, goes back to um, uh, the late 2000s. Uh, it's called CES, stands for Secure ECMAScript. ECMAScript is the standards name for JavaScript. Uh, and it's now in quite a lot of use. Um, uh, we'll be hearing talks today from MetaMask and from Modable. MetaMask is using it uh, in the browser through a ex secure extension for interacting with blockchains. Uh, Modable for devices where they're dr they've directly built a CES machine. Um, uh, we're using it, of course, for distributed smart contracting on top of blockchains and across uh, and between blockchains and non-chains. Uh, Salesforce, uh, for which we've code Salesforce and Agora co-developed the modern SaaS platform. Uh, Salesforce has a five million developer ecosystem riding on the SaaS platform. Uh, Elements of SaaS has been adopted into Node Core, and there's a new standards committee <coughs> under ECMA TC53. That's the standards committee uh, for standardizing the JavaScript modules for use in embedded devices. Uh, and that committee is ex has, has explicitly decided that CES is the base JavaScript for standardizing the JavaScript for embedded devices. So all of these elements historically have, are, are things that we've gotten into JavaScript over the years, starting with ECMAScript 5, um, in order to enable this kind of object capability secure programming. Uh, all of these things have been gotten in to, to help enable JavaScript to be used in a safer and more secure manner. Uh, and they're the enablers that enable a library loaded into a, a conforming JavaScript today to turn it into a CES system. Um, and the important thing is not what we've added to JavaScript. The important thing is what we've removed. Uh, that the, 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 import, the most important aspect of these enablers is that the enablers enable one enable code to enforce that other code stay within the restrictions, the object capability restrictions. So JavaScript, going back to ECMAScript 3, was an extremely messy language. It had all sorts of crazy things in it, things with non-local causality, violations of lexical scoping, per pervasive access and implicit access to the global object. Uh, so with ECMAScript 5, we introduced a strict mode uh, in order to peel away the worst aspects of JavaScript, which you can't actually remove because you can't break the web, but they're now, they're now quarantined off in sloppy mode. Um, uh, but, but strict mode itself, although it has the enablers, is not itself yet an object capability language. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, normal JavaScript today in strict mode still has a shared global object by everything that's together in one realm. By realm, what I mean is um, uh, the set of, of, when you create a new frame in the browser, uh, that creates a new JavaScript realm, which is a set of primordial objects. Uh, the objects that you can reach in the initial state, the objects that, that must exist before code starts running, like array, array.prototype, array.prototype.push, for every realm, for every set of those, there used to just be one global object and one global scope. And that means that you can't separate the logic of those things from each other. Uh, and the result is that modules loaded into JavaScript today are massively vulnerable to each other. Um, uh, a flaw in one module uh, or, an, or an exploit or just a, 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 an exploitable flaw uh, enables the entire application that includes that module uh, to be compromised. So instead, what we do um, is we introduce the mechanisms of CES, which we currently have running securely as a shim, and we're now also in standards track to propose to be directly supported by the engines. Um, 
we've removed those few really damaging parts of standard JavaScript. We've enforced that they're inaccessible. And we enable multiple global scopes, which we call compartments, to coexist uh, within one realm. Uh, and then, um, and the key thing about CES is that it includes almost all of JavaScript. Experience at Google, at Salesforce, at Agoric, at MetaMask, and others uh, uh, verifies that a tremendous amount of existing JavaScript code that was not written to run under CES does successfully run under CES. Uh, however, uh, JavaScript includes many messy things that sane people shouldn't be using. Um, so we define a tiny subset of CES called Jesse, which is what we're using to write our, our own code that needs to be highly reliable and what we're suggesting other people use, although we're providing the full CES platform. Uh, the counterexample that you saw uh, is written in Jesse, uh, but over here, this is a, um, uh, this is a, a re record of a session with a full CES REPL. Uh, so let's say you define uh, two global variables, x and y. And of course, in that context, with that global, if you just say x plus y, it gives you 5. With CES, you can create an evaluator. Uh, and an evaluator uh, is a new execution context with its own global, its own global scope, and its own evaluators. Um, and because it has its own global scope, if you just evaluate x plus y there, you get you get the expected reference error. Uh, the evaluator API allows you to provide endowments which are turned into other variables in the global scope uh, uh, so that we can now evaluate the string x plus y in that, in, within that global scope and it gives us the 16, they're distinct x and y's. Uh, but it's not just that we're controlling scoping. Uh, I mentioned that there is all of this shared primordial state, all of the objects that need to exist before code starts running. Uh, normally, that entire set of objects is completely mutable. Uh, so that if somebody defines an, e an evil function, then you can, you, they, can they can replace array.prototype push with their evil function and anybody else within the same realm uh, if they try to modify, if they try to just push something onto an object, uh, onto an array, will instead be invoking the attacker's evil function. And we've seen exploits. Um, uh, people, um, we've seen various exploits by people making malicious upgrades to packages listed on NPM in order to, for example, steal Bitcoin from other applications built using that packages. Um, so. What, S, what CES does is it uses object.freeze to completely lock down all the primordials, to make them all immutable. Uh, and the result is that the different compartments running in the same, in the, within the same context, sharing all those, those primordial objects, they cannot corrupt each other. They cannot even use the primordials to communicate with each other. And at Agoric, what we're doing is we are writing in CES and, in fact, most of our code in Jesse more layers of abstraction up uh, to the point where we're uh, creating systems of commerce and smart contracts running on blockchains and running in a distributed manner using, uh, Java, using JavaScript as a distributed programming language. Uh, for whom some of the, the enablers are also making progress through the committee. Uh, and as an example, uh, this is kind of the essence of the money system uh, that we're doing with the money, with the money ex abstraction on the right running on a blockchain. And this code written in Jesse, run on a blockchain, gives you a decent distributed secure money system. Um, and um, clearly, we're, we're, you know, what we're doing is, is building up from that a much richer framework for doing commerce and smart contracting. And, um, uh, but today, I want to focus on CES for the overall JavaScript ecosystem, including smart contracts and blockchain, but also including um, devices and, and, all the, and Salesforce and all the rest of it.
And now I'll take questions. Okay. How does Spectre affect this stuff? If you have untrusted code running uh, in, uh, in, yeah, in I am so glad you asked. <laughs> that, that, I will. Yeah. So Spectre and Meltdown and a bunch of side channel attacks um, uh, read secret data um, uh, that's resi that, that is especially if it's in the same address space, read secret data by doing timing attacks, by doing various things that, sh that, that by the semantics of the language <laughs> do not access the data, but because of the way the language is implemented, and especially because of the way the instruction set of the machine is implemented, uh, by measuring the duration of these different operations, uh, you can, and, you, and, and with enough knowledge about what's going on, you can often figure out what the secret data is that you're not supposed to know. Um, we cannot prevent, none of this technology prevents those side channels from existing such that someone who's in a position to measure duration um, uh, would not be able to read those side channels. Uh, what we can do is we can control the ability to measure duration. So uh, we had a challenge page up. We need to, to put the challenge page back up. But uh, a challenge page up of a, essentially a CES environment in which there is a really gross side channel, a side channel that's been engineered to be trivially easy to read uh, if you can measure duration even crudely. Uh, but then, within that environment, we deny access to date.now. Uh, we, we, we deny, basically, all of the things from the host that would give ability to measure duration. And then we challenge you, uh, see if you can read the side channel that we've gone out of our way to create. Uh, and we believe that these techniques uh, for code that does not need the ability to measure duration we can prevent it from measuring duration. That's a small category of code, but it's much larger than you expect. There's a tremendous amount of transformational programs, programs that just read inputs, compute some output, and, and stop. Uh, you know, pattern, pattern recognizers, uh, formatters, parsers, all sorts of crazy things. There's a lot of NPM or such modules. Trivially using CES, you can run them denying them anything that would enable them to measure duration. And now your exposure to side channels are just your remaining modules. Yeah? Does it also frustrate Rogue Hammer? <laughs> I'm sorry, I may be totally the question. Does it also frustrate Rogue Hammer? Um, uh, the answer is, yeah. The answer is no. Uh, Rohammer, there's good news and bad news in that, which is uh, Rohammer itself, which is an attack on integrity, uh, um, is machines that, that, that did not skimp on refresh rate, and especially machines that have error correcting memory, are essentially not vulnerable to Rohammer as a threat to integrity. However, there is a corresponding threat using the same technology, but not to change the bits, but rather to um, uh, induce error correction and measure the time uh, so that you can use this other row hammer um, uh, to, to read a side channel. Uh, and that one is not protected by decent refresh rates or error correcting memory. In fact, it's taking advantage of the error correction. Uh, it's only doing leakage, it's not doing corruption. That's right. You can't do corruption. <coughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, way, way too deep. Uh, the answer is the side channel we can prevent for code that we can deny duration, including the, this uh, version of Rohammer. And for the corrupting one, uh, if you're running on a decent machine, it shouldn't be a problem. was the
the basic idea. Now we're going to see how some of it gets used in very interesting places.